Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church, Lawrence, Kansas. We're delighted to have you worship with us today from wherever you are. If you're logged into YouTube, please join the chat and make your presence known to us. Today, May 31st, 2020, is a holy day in the Christian calendar. It is Pentecost Sunday. As we prepare to light the Christ candle, our own fiery symbol of God's eternal presence among us, hear these words from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs in our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. The story continues from Acts. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. 
And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even upon my slaves, both men and women. In those days I will pour my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. be with you. Lift up your hearts. Share now the peace of Christ with those in your own household. Share it with somebody that you are worshiping with virtually. Uh, Send them a text or uh, maybe on the chat line. Send a word of peace as we pass the peace to one another today. Today's gospel reading comes from John, 
chapter 7, we'll read verses 37 to 39. On the last day of the festival, the great day, while Jesus was standing there, he cried out, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let the one who believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. Now he said this about the spirit, which believers in him were to receive, for as yet there was no spirit, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. At this time in our worship together, we hear our joys and concerns and take this time to pray together. This morning, we remember in particular Emmanuel Lutheran Church, the local church here. We remember American Baptist Church's USA Executive Minister, Jane Gibbons, who serves ABC Churches of Ohio. And we remember International Ministries missionary, Madeline Flores Lopez. As well as um, the current events and the news stories that we've heard in the last week. Climbing death tolls from COVID-19 and the violence and disparities in some of our communities across the country. Will you join me now in the unison discipline of confession, followed by a short time of silent confession? God of new creation, we confess that we have failed to trust your bountiful goodness. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you brought forth the earth and its creatures in abundance. Yet... We hoard Earth's resources and refuse to share your gifts. We dishonor your generosity by withholding our charity to those in need. We betray your kindness by dealing harshly with our enemies. We disregard your compassion by severely judging the sins of others. Forgive us. By the power of your spirit, Renew our hearts and free us from sins that we may enjoy the fullness of your blessing upon all creation. Sisters and brothers, God offers forgiveness of our sins and the grace of repentance. Accept God's grace, repent of your sin, and be restored to abundant life. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Break us mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Today we call upon the fiery rushing wind of your breath, O oh God. On this day that we celebrate the miraculous outpouring of speech and understanding we cry for both. O oh Lord our God, we need words and wisdom to wrestle with the notion that so many have died, rendered unable to breathe by a microscopic virus, even as we remember it's your breath in our lungs. O oh Lord our God, we need language to express the deep groans of lament and anger over racial injustice in our country. Disparities that have snuffed out the life breath of far too many who bear your image. 
We confess that we've been silent for too long while our brown and black sisters and brothers bore this heavy burden alone. We seek your forgiveness and we seek boldness to move beyond our comfort and into right and just action. We proclaim that we trust you in all things in the hard stuff of everyday life and even through death. And we offer our very selves to your just and perfect will. Wherever you lead, we will follow. We now reaffirm your lordship in our lives by joining our hearts and voices in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's New Testament reading comes from the book of 1 Corinthians, and we'll read a selection from chapter 12. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Just as no one can confess Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit, I would argue that no one is generous except by that same Spirit. God's very nature is that of generosity. How else could God willingly share God's image with humanity and creativity with creation? How else could God willingly share God's very own breath to enliven every creature? How else could God so willingly pour out God's very own life in the name of friendship? God is undeniably generous, and if we are filled by and anointed by God's Spirit as we proclaim, we bear the imprint of God's generosity, and we share God's generous character. Today, I invite you, wherever you are, to confess Jesus is Lord by the Spirit and by that same Spirit to live into that confession with your generosity, the generous Spirit given you by God. You can offer your gifts through our church's online portal on the website where it says Give. The information will be on your screen and in the YouTube comments. 
Or you can always mail a check to the church office or drop one off in person by making arrangements with the church staff. Thank you for your faithful generosity. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above the heavenly host, Creator Christ and Holy Ghost. God, you have given us so many good gifts. Help us now to return a portion of those gifts, not only uh, monetarily, but also the gifts of our talents, the gifts, uh, the things that you have allowed us to do in your uh, gospel work, and uh, the gift of our heart. God, may we return that now to you as we give all good and perfect gifts uh, back to the Creator who has given us those gifts in the first place. In your name we pray. Amen. Several of you, in terms of uh, uh, what your faith looks like right now, in our, our Faith Now series. Well, often you all get to, to hear me standing up here talking. Oftentimes you uh, get to hear uh, my children as the youth lead in our youth worship, but you uh, don't get a chance to hear from my wife, Kimberly Sturdivant, uh, nearly as often as you should. And so here is an opportunity to do just that. The evangelism team reached out to her. A few weeks ago, and uh, uh, Kylie Johnston interviewed her as a part of the Faith Now series. And so now you'll get to hear a chance, uh, a little bit about her story in uh, the coming moments. I grew up Southern Baptist, but I didn't become a Christian until I was 13. Um, it was at a U Skin retreat thing for the youth group. And they happened to come to our church um, for the weekend. It was some college from, students from um, Cumberland College, which is a Christian college in Kentucky. And um, 
anyway, so uh, we had this like rock concert, if you will, as part of the weekend. And so after that, um, they did the invitation and I went forward then and um, during the rock concert. And then you had to go um, up like on Sunday morning when church reconvened or whatever that it wasn't just for the youth time so anyway um and the pastor when i went forward said i already thought you were a christian and um that's kind of how my whole growing up years were like i was always at church and always um followed the rules and you know did what was expected of me i guess and i was an only child so i don't know if that had something to do with it but um I didn't know Jesus, but I was a good person. And um, so I just always felt like I, ha I wasn't ready. I was waiting for that feeling or that sign that, you know, that I'm supposed to go forward. And um, so anyway, that's kind of how I um, became a Christian. And then my life didn't really change that much even after that. I mean, I still went to church all the time and was active. It just, I had that personal relationship with him now that I didn't really have before. Um, and I mean, I talked to God a lot, not just um, like in prayer time, but I feel like half the time when I talk to myself about thoughts and feelings, it's you know, I'm kind of asking God's opinion, even though he doesn't always answer literally like I want him to. Um, but um, I think deep down I have a lot of faith, although it's not really been tested, I guess. And I'm thankful that I haven't had a lot of, you know, struggles to which I needed to really, really rely on that. But then Again, I don't know what that's like either, since I, I don't feel like I've had that, um, those times yet. Um, I'm sure they're to come. <laughs> I don't really have like a specific prayer time. I've, throughout my life, I think I've tried like to have a prayer journal and um, to keep up with everybody's prayers who says, please pray for me or, you know, and I've just, I, I can't do that or I haven't been able to master that. So as soon as I say, I will pray for you, like I, I pray right then for that person, it's more meaningful. And I don't want to ever say that I'm going to pray for you and then not do it. I feel worse about that. So I feel like that's a way I can make it work for me. I guess growing up, I, I felt like I had to do all the steps to like, I have to read my Bible for this length of time and I have to you know, um, maybe read something from this prayer book or this journal or um, devotional. And it got to where it was more um, just a routine and not meaningful. And so um, I have to watch that it it is, um, I'm doing it for the right reasons, I guess. I mean, of course, I want to be close to God, but I don't want to just follow all these steps because that's not really getting me closer it's just checking off a list and um you know that's not really in my opinion what he wants he wants you know he wants us to talk to him every day or every second so I feel like my faith is more active I guess than just reading my bible and praying that's important and it's a, a very good foundation but I feel like I'm to the point where I need to be more active and let my faith lead me to help people. I think in, in both, just being open-minded and listening to all sides and, you know, use what people tell you and what you know, but come to your own decisions and, um, be okay that they might be different than what your friends think. So. When Matt reached out to me this week and asked if I was available and willing to sing, and of course I said, absolutely, he said, what are you thinking about? 
And without hesitation, I texted back and told him the name of the song that I'm going to sing here in just a minute. As we go through these very uncertain times, what are we hearing? People need social distancing. People need testing. People need contact tracing. People need a vaccine. Well, I tell you, people need the Lord. Every day they pass me by I can see it in their eyes Empty people
Amen and amen. Hear now these words from the prophet Joel. The text for Peter's Pentecost sermon. Then afterward I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. Even On the male and female slaves, in those days I will pour out my spirit. Amen. The Zoom room was starting to fill up. There were two, and then there were eight, and then there were twelve, and then there were fifteen, and everybody looked around for the meeting to start and realized that the person who had called the meeting hadn't shown up yet. So uh, as uh, the, the Zoom small talk began, uh, people started asking, well, what good takeout have you found recently? Anybody uh, brave enough to go get a haircut? How's everybody doing all this? Uh, and then, then it happened. Somebody said a thing. It was a thing about the, uh, the, the latest numbers or the, the thing about uh, the, the last uh, political statement made or the thing about it. It doesn't really matter what the thing was. Because everybody in the room thought the same thing. And one person had the guts to say it. Well, who said it? And that's when everything fell apart. Somebody said, well, was it, was it that Fauci guy? I can't believe anything that he says. I don't even know if I'm saying his name right. I don't believe anything that he says in front of that camera. And then somebody else on the other side of the Zoom uh, spoke up. Well, uh, he, he knows a lot more than Trump. I wish Trump would just keep his mouth shut. Why does he keep saying stuff that he doesn't know anything about? He's causing more trouble than anybody. And then on the other side of the Zoom room, somebody else said, well, uh, at least he shoots straight. At least you know where he's coming from. As far as I know, Kelly, our own governor, what's she doing? She's just trying to, uh, all the Democrats, trying to destroy the economy so that they look better in the fall. They don't really care about us. All they want to do is make themselves look better in the long run. And by the time the person who had actually called the Zoom meeting together showed up, they found a Brady Bunch screen of total chaos. Anybody know the feeling? In these days, we uh, continue to, to see this angst pour out from so many encounters with one another. Uh, Kimberly and I were out walking the dogs the other day, and and we saw this this big sign out in our neighborhood, and it says, we're all in this together. Are we? Can can we really say that we are? How many of us are just in that uh, that same Zoom room? Well, I don't trust that person. I I don't trust that person. I don't think that person has my best interests in mind. I don't know that we are all in this together. When you read news stories uh, and see responses from folks, well, I can't arrest you because uh, uh, you don't uh, listen to the same news station that I do, or you're not the same political party that I am. I can't trust you because you don't look like me. You don't sound like me. You don't use the same language. You're a different gender. You're uh, a different uh, kind of person than I am. I can't trust you. I, I could trust people who are heterosexual, but all those, all those other initials, I don't even know what those mean. Uh, not a chance. I can't trust you. In fact, if You tell me to wear a mask in your store, I have every right to pull out a gun and shoot you. I can't trust you as my governor. In fact, I have the right to hang you in effigy from a tree. I wish I was making it all up. And I wish it was better here in the church, right? But how often do we do the same thing? Snipe at each other? I can't trust uh, somebody that that looks like that. I can't trust somebody of that gender. I can't trust somebody of that race. I can't trust somebody of that denomination. I can't trust you because I don't know for sure 
or how you voted last fall. Here, even in the church, I wince when I see signs that say we're all in this together. Are we? Well, we live in uncertain times, don't we? And as I've said now five weeks in a row, we are not the first people of God to live in uncertain days. As we read in the, the Pentecost story, you, you heard Angie and me both read it this morning. It's a, it's a story uh, that, that comes from a, a moment in which uh, the people of God were in this, this deep uh, moment of angst, this deep moment of, of pain. The Romans uh, had, had oppressed them. They were, uh, uh, had their boot uh, down on top of the, the people of God, and it was not a pretty picture. The, the, the next uh, Roman official could come in and, and wipe out whatever they wanted. They could say, you're not allowed to worship in this way. You're not allowed to do this in this way. The, uh, the military force, the police force could do whatever they want, impose whatever violence they wanted on any member, and they had no repercussion at all. Everybody uh, was in fear, constant fear, of that oppressor that was beyond, that oppressor that looked them in the face and said, we can do whatever we want to you. In the midst of these days, the, uh, the people of God gathered for a party, for a festival, for a feast, the Feast of Pentecost. You, you may though know the history of the, the story of Pentecost. It's basically a, a feast that, that, that celebrated um, kind of the, the coming of God's law. It was a kind of a two-part feast, so uh, a Passover happened, uh, reminding the people of when God uh, helped them out of the, uh, the, the, the slavery of Egypt, right? Uh, released them out of that, that bondage. Uh, and then uh, 50 days later, hence the word Pentecost, uh, they celebrate uh, what was, was both a, a harvest festival and also a, a festival in which they remembered after that releasing of bondage, God came to them on Sinai and brought them the word there, the law, the Torah. They were able to then understand what their covenant with their God was. And so at the second part of this festival here at Pentecost, all of the people gathered together. Uh, and it seemed to be that there was this, this, this joyous moment. It seemed to be that everybody was on the same page. It seemed that they were all in this together, but they weren't. We could read between the lines and see pretty clearly that there was still a very uh, difficult uh, relationship between the people of God, how they looked at each other, how they sniped at each other in reaction to the Roman oppression of the boots that came down upon their necks. Some chose the, the way of violence, like the zealots. Some chose the way of escape, like the Essenes into the desert. Some chose the way of privilege uh, to cozy up uh, to those powers, to cozy up to the Romans and uh, basically uh, gather around uh, that power uh, so that they could maybe glean a little bit of power from them. Uh, the temple authorities did this. The, uh, the Sadducees did this. Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, a lot of the people that, that Jesus fought with pretty often, they were the ones that chose this way of privilege to say, look at the little bit of power I have and now I can use that power on others. You see it in the Pentecost story. It's kind of, like I say, between the lines again and again. As soon as the, the disciples come out uh, of uh, the upper room and, and begin speaking to all of these different people, uh, what, what's the response, right? It was kind of at the, the tail end of what Angie read. It was it, like, oh, oh, look at these people. Uh, uh, did you hear? These are just, these Galileans. Right? I wish, I wish the Bible had a, a, a tone indicator uh, that came with it, right? So you could hear how they said the word. Um, imagine, uh, maybe some of you had, have said a word kind of like that before. Um, uh, maybe uh, when you, you hear somebody's accent, as they did those Galilean accents, uh, you hear somebody and say, oh, oh, they must be a, a southerner. Hmm, yeah. We know about them. Or you, you've, you've seen it in the other kind of uh, geographical or, or racial uh, stereotypes. Uh, the way anybody who's Latino uh, gets called a Mexican. The way anybody who is of Asian descent gets called Chinese. I don't even want to use the words from the pulpit that, that we call those with black bodies in our culture today. We, we hear and we see and we judge and we say, look at those people. And the tone that comes out, those Galileans, 
is harsh and is angry. There's a class context to it too. Listen to the, the words that uh, uh, they said. They, they said, well, look, look at what these people are doing. They're, they're obviously drunk on, on, on cheap wine. They said new wine, but new wine is cheap wine. And so here they're saying, here are these, these backwater, no account, rednecks that are coming in and messing up our party. The people of privilege felt their toes stepped on by the disciples of God. But what did the Spirit do? Did the Spirit back away in that moment? Did the Spirit say, oh, I didn't, I didn't mean to offend your sensibilities? Absolutely not. This is when the Spirit exploded into the midst of that Pentecost brokenness, into the midst of the, the doubt and the, the sneering and the anger and the judgment that they had. And it came into this moment and it brought a spirit of unity. It brought with it a new spirit of power. Now, now let, me, let me pause a little bit when I, when I talk about that word. Uh, that, that word unity, uh, because uh, it, it could be used to, to, to describe something that I don't want to describe. Um, there, there are different ways to, to understand uh, what unity is, is all about. And, and as, uh, you can uh, see looking in the text, there's, there's a, a, a something that, that I don't want to, to, to get distracted about. Look in, indeed what it says. Uh, unity invites all to be a part Uniformity says, well, we're all in this together. See the difference? What came on Pentecost was not uniformity. was not a, a, a pretend, let's just all come and do the same thing together. Now, the Holy Spirit could have done this. Look, the Holy Spirit could have come to Pentecost and gone out and made all of the different uh, voices, all the different people, all of the different pilgrims who were gathered in that place, could have made them hear the Galilean tongue. Could have forced them to say, look, this is what you have to believe. This is what you have to experience. Could have said to the, the Parthians and the Medes and the Mesopotamians and everybody, okay, well you now have to understand us. But that's not what happened. That would be uniformity, but it's not what the Spirit did. Instead, the Spirit came and the people of God learned how to speak in new ways. Learn how to speak in new languages. All of them hearing in their own tongue the power of resurrection and the power of God's love. Last week we talked in the, the two-way uh, about the, the story of the Tower of Babel. Remember the Tower of Babel uh, in which uh, early in Genesis uh, the, the, the people of God or uh, all of the people really on the world are, are starting to build this tower so that they can become a, a more prideful uh, and it gets destroyed. God says, no, I'm not going to allow that pride to happen. Uh, and so it gets scattered and all these different uh, uh, languages develop. And some people have said over the years, uh, indeed, and we talked about this in the two way, that, that this uh, Pentecost story is kind of a, um, um, a reversal of Babel, right? Now here's, here's the reversal, right? All of the, uh, the, the, the languages now come together and speak one language, but that's not what it is. That's not what happened. It's not uniformity. It's not all, y'all come and understand me. It's scholar Justo Gonzalez that suggests that Pentecost is not an undoing of the Tower of Babel. It is a second Babel. It is a new scattering, but it is a scattering not based on pride, but a scattering based on humility to go into new places and to listen with new ears. Instead of bringing uniformity, all of us are the same now. The power of the Spirit was to bring unity even in the midst of these differences. I would argue that it's... It's not just in the midst of, it's not just in spite of, it's because of those differences. It's exactly what the Spirit was about to, was to enjoy and to employ that diversity among the people. That's what uh, Peter's uh, sermon was all about, right? He, he, he preached from the gospel uh, uh, according to the prophet Joel, right? I mean, he could have preached from anything in his, uh, uh, in his Bible, right? He could have preached from Genesis. He could have preached from uh, the Torah. He could have preached from, uh, from Isaiah. He could have preached from any prophet, but he picked Joel. I mean, really? <laughs> I mean, Joel's okay for a, a prophet and all, but he's just a little bit of stuff. There's not any. Why, why Joel? I think he picked Joel because Joel got it. He knew what the diversity 
of God's Spirit was all about. Look at the language that he says, old, young, women, men, married, unmarried, slave, free, all of them have a voice to share. All of them are a part of God's diversity. Out of all the passages Peter could have picked, he picked these passages that, that, that demonstrates that the coming of God to earth will be necessarily accompanied by a diversity of voices, by hearing all of the voices that God has created. All of God's people have the power to prophesy regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of nationality, regardless of position. Isn't that what we've been going through? This whole series, right? All, every single week, every time we've, we've talked about yet another voice that comes from the margins, right? God can speak through any voice, even a woman like Deborah or like Hola, even a racial outcast like Miriam, uh, even a religious minority like Esther. Now what happens? What happens to God's people if it weren't for these voices that we've been talking about over these last weeks, right? Moses lays there in the, in the bulrushes until the soldiers come and kill him. Uh, Barak doesn't even go into battle without uh, his, uh, uh, his kind of a companion, his compatriot, Deborah, at his, ho- at his side. Uh, Josiah, he doesn't even go uh, into the, uh, the, the energy of, of reforming God's people if he doesn't have the passion of Hulda in his ear. And, <laughs> and without Esther, none of them are there. They're all dead. These are the voices that God has spoken through. All of this makes uh, a reminder that it's not about uniformity. It's not about you be like me, you act like me, you sound like me, you look like me. It's in the diversity of you be who God made you to be. That is the Pentecost story. That is the story of all of Scripture again and again and again. Be who God made you to be. Speak from that voice. That is what the Holy Spirit will do to bring unity to God's people. And I would suggest that today, that today that the church in 2020 needs to hear that message once again. We need to hear once again that it's, it's not about the way that, that, that we, we separate, that we stratify, right? Um, how, how often, uh, just like the, uh, uh, the, the, the people there in Pentecost, they, they said, well, well you're, you're, you're here with me, but you're down here, right? Uh, you're, you're okay, you're in the middle here, but you're one of the Galileans, right? Uh, how often do we do the same thing today? How often do we put people in categories? Well, okay, well, uh, well, the Democrats are up here, the Republicans are down here. Well, the Kansas Republicans, they're okay, but all the other Republicans, yeah, they're, they're right at the bottom, right? We put these people into these categories, we put these people into these different places, and we judge and say, well, here's where everybody belongs, here's where everybody needs to be, but look again at what Huso Gonzalez says. He says that the story of the Pentecost uh, is, is about a great leveling. All of a sudden... All of God's people pour out of the room together. The women, the men, the top 12 disciples, and that guy you never heard of and don't even know his name. All of them came out of the room together, and each of them had a different voice to share with a different person. That is the great leveling power of the Spirit. That is what the Spirit does in our lives today, to to remind us that that any voice can be the voice of God, whether it's an outcast like so many of the voices in the Bible, or whether it's an outcast in the words that we hear in our life today. Who is it, Dr. King, that says that that rioting is is the, the language of the unheard, an attempt to say, this is my voice, this is what I want to say. What if in 2020 we could hear those voices afresh? What if we could listen to those who are hurting in our midst? What if we could look out in the world and say, I'm scared, I'm afraid, I'm living at home and I don't know what to do, I can't even get out of my own home. How about if we listen to those voices? If we reach out and we speak to them, we communicate to them, if we listen, like Dr. King said, are we listening? Are we listening to those who are hurting in our world today? That is our call. That is the Pentecost call today, in 2020, in this moment, to know that any voice can be the voice of God, that any voice can prophesy to us in this moment and in this place. We don't know. We don't know uh, what, what God is doing in our midst. Uh, but isn't that the, the, the moment that Pentecost brought? We don't know, just like they didn't know. 
They were there in their upper room, hiding, waiting, wondering. They had a promise. They had a hope. They knew Jesus had said it was going to be okay, but they had no idea what it would look like and no idea when it was going to start. But look, they exploded out of that room, and they all went all over the place, and they brought that voice of hope, and they brought that story of resurrection to all to hear. May that be our calling today. May we be the people of God of Pentecost in 2020. May we be the ones who can share that story of hope. May we be the ones that listen to those voices, that celebrate those voices, that hear that pain, and that come together to speak. May we be the ones to prophesy in these days. Sons and daughters, you have the power to prophesy today. You have the power to be the same voices that flooded out of that room and came into a new place. Now, I'm not talking physically. I'm not talking about uh, leaving shelter in place. That's not what I mean. I'm talking about how can we relationally flood out of our rooms and out of our homes and out of our lives and out of our uh, small assumptions of the way the world works and hear and see a bigger world that God is making. How can we flood out of our small existence and see what God is doing, just like those that we have studied over these last weeks. May we today know that that is our story as well. That that, that we don't need to put up a sign that says that we are all in this together because we as the church, we become that sign to talk about what unity looks like. Not uniformity, not just be like me, but unity in the way the Spirit created unity. May that Spirit, may that promise come from our halls, come from our uh, wavelengths, come from our uh, virtual preaching, come from our church. May that be the way that we speak in 2020 and beyond. May we have the wisdom of Deborah. May we have uh, the faithfulness of Miriam. May we have the passion of Holda. Uh, and may we have the commitment and bravery and courage of Esther. May we, sons and daughters, prophesy in these days to the hope that Christ has brought us and wants to bring the world. You, you today, can be those heroes. You today can be that promise. Sons and daughters of Christ, prophesy in these days. Come, let us be church together. Let us pray. Pentecostal spirit, in our hearts and in our lives and in our churches, on our websites, in our social media, in our texting conversations, in the ways that we reach out and care for our neighbors, no matter what skin color they have. Help us in this day, this Pentecost hour, to listen, to defend to celebrate, to preach. May we be that sign that the world so desperately needs to hear, that there is your resurrection hope. May that be the story on our lips and in our hearts. In your name we pray, amen. this time, uh, gather uh, virtually from all these different places. Uh, Perhaps you have a response. Perhaps you have a a word that you want to share. Maybe share it on the chat. Uh, Many of you have my text. Uh, Give me a word just to share what God is speaking on your heart today. As we sing our final song together, um, I want to know, how is it that the Spirit is laying upon your heart, your words, sons and daughters, to prophesy. On Pentecost 
must they gather quite early in the day. A band of Christ's disciples to worship, sing, and pray. A mighty wind came blowing, filled all the swirling air, and tongues of Thank you all for joining us on this day. Uh, in the next uh, few days, next several, several weeks actually, we begin a new series. Uh, communion is next week and we begin a new series to talk about uh, what mental health looks like uh, kind of in the life of faith, how we might be a good friend to those who are struggling with mental health issues, uh, especially in a um, kind of mental health pandemic uh, that continues to grow. Uh, especially as, uh, as people are more isolated than they were before. How can we be Christians? How can we be the church to them? That's what we'll talk about with these next several weeks uh, with some special guests along the way. Uh, plan to be a part of that. And uh, just off of screen this whole time, uh, we have had uh, uh, this beauty right here. This is a scissor lift that has been working on our stained glass project. Uh, several uh, of you might have seen the video that I posted this week uh, as some of the stained glass was coming out. It's being restored. Other stained glass has been uh, removed from the top and it kind of been reworked. Uh, we've found, as, as a surprise to nobody, uh, that uh, we're, we're working on uh, getting through years and years of, of damage that's been up there uh, from water and rain and et cetera, et cetera. And so as we fix this, as we work on this, uh, this guy's going to be here for a little while longer uh, as the, uh, the, uh, the crew continues their work. So again, you're uh, invited to, to be uh, generous in the, the, the way that we uh, continue and uh, complete this project. And I'm very thankful for those who have been generous uh, already in helping to make sure that we have this, uh, this happen. You know, it's interesting. The, uh, the, the, the pattern that uh, our stained glass is, is called uh, the living flame. What a great, uh, beautiful metaphor uh, for Pentecost Sunday. That as uh, the, the light streams in through these windows, it's a reminder of, of Pentecost. Pentecost streaming into our hearts and into our church. So indeed, uh, that is the way that, uh, that I send you uh, from this place uh, into the world, into uh, our, our, our week of, uh, of living in, uh, uh, in the midst of uh, what continues to be uh, a struggling uh, world. Uh, we've said these words together, but I read them back to you as a reminder of uh, what our calling is. God pours the Holy Spirit on all those who believe, on women, men, and children who would God's grace 
receive. That spirit knows no limit, bestowing life and power. The church, formed and reforming, responds in every hour. O spirit sent from heaven on that day long ago, rekindle faith among us in all life's ebb and flow. O give us hearts to listen and tongues aflame with praise. So folk of every nation, glad songs of joy shall raise. We live in uncertain times, but you, sisters and brothers, are the heroes that we need. Go be heroes for Christ in these days. Amen.